Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you all for joining us for this installment of uh, Conversations on Race and Policing. Uh, we're very honored to have with us today our uh, guest speaker, Ben Montgomery, whom we'll introduce uh, formally in a few minutes. Um, we reached out to Ben and he was extraordinarily gracious in accepting our invitation. So we really uh, are, are grateful and appreciative for his presence today. Um, we also have with us um, Dean Mohammed. I'll introduce him shortly and also uh, Stan Futch, president of the Westside Action Group. Uh, we begin our, our session today um, with CSUSB's land acknowledgement. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Uh, and now I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. A. Rafiq Mohammed, uh, Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. He is today, he is uh, our guest moderator today. Dr. Mohammed received his bachelor's degree at George Washington University in sociology and criminology and criminal justice, uh, then went on to UC Irvine for a master's in social ecology, a PhD in criminology and law and society. He taught and served as chair in the sociology department at the University of San Diego and also chaired the social sciences department at Clayton State University in Georgia, all before coming to CSUSB in 2015. He is the author of Black Men on the Blacktop, Basketball and the Politics of Race. And he is co-author with Eric Fritzwald of Dorm Room Dealers, Drugs and the Privileges of Race and Class. Uh, Give me a great pleasure to introduce today's uh, host and moderator, Dean Rafiq Mohammed. Thank you very much, Robbie. And thank you to you and Jeremy and everybody else for putting on this great event and for continuing, I think, this very important conversation uh, for the past many months. Um, I, I know that uh, lots of folks would rather kind of forget about where we are in the context of race and inequality in our society, but uh, I think it's essential that we continue to have these conversations. Um, I would also like to thank everybody who's here in attendance today uh, and everybody else who played a hand in pulling this together uh, all at a distance. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to introduce today's uh, guest speaker, uh, and, and someone with whom we will have a, a, a very, I'm sure, lively conversation in just a moment. Uh, but today's guest is Ben Montgomery. I don't know if you can see it. I, I, the background's on, I'll just tell you. <laughs> but he, he authored a book that I will, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to, to put in the chat a link to it. Um, but uh, the book is titled A Shot in the Moonlight, How a Freed Slave and Confederate Soldier Fought for Justice in the Jim Crow South. I had the great pleasure of reading this book over the past uh, week or so. And it's a, it's a phenomenal book and I encourage everybody to uh, read it for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is I think it does an excellent job of kind of connecting where we are now to in, in terms of issues of race and inequality in the United States to uh, other events that occurred uh, shortly after the Civil War's conclusion uh, and, and since. Uh, a little bit about Mr. Montgomery. Ben Montgomery is a former enterprise reporter for the Tampa Bay Times and founder of the narrative journalism website gangry.com. In 2010, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in local reporting and won the Dart Award and Casey Medal for a series called For Their Own Good about abuse at Florida's oldest reform school. He lives in Tampa, uh, Florida, with his children. He's the author of The Man Who Walked Backward, The Leper Spy, and Grandma's Gatewood Walk. Um, a little bit about this book before I toss to, uh, to Mr. Montgomery. Um, I, I, again, I think this book is really important. Um, I didn't know anything about it before I read it, and I really appreciate Robbie Madrigal bringing this to our attention. Um, but I think the book does a wonderful job kind of capturing some really essential themes around social inequalities, uh, sp specifically as it relates to historically and also in the con contemporary sense, uh, issues of criminal justice, uh, property, uh, uh, overall disenfranchisement, uh, political representation. I also think the book does a great job of kind of painting a picture of uh, the long tradition that we have in this country of racial injustice. Um, and also, you know, in, in a less bleak way, the kind of constant drumbeat of resistance to injustice that has 
been there as part of our culture at every interval, uh, whether it be during uh, enslavement or whether it be uh, during uh, 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 Jim Crow or, or even now, how people have always kind of pushed back against injustice. And, and also, I think it paints a, a good picture of uh, people who weren't necessarily subjugated, but felt uh, a, a kind of a, a righteous calling to lend a hand to, to a cause that they thought was more important than their own uh, personal interests. Um, it also you know, illustrates, again, I think the, the importance of us understanding this history and having conversations uh, that, we, that, we, um, that we need to continue to have. Uh, as, as a way to kind of introduce the book, I thought it'd be good just to read a, a little excerpt from the preface, and then I, we will ask Mr. Montgomery to share some of uh, his thoughts on the book and, and kind of explain a little bit of the story of the book. But I just have a couple of segments of the, of the preface that I want to read, if, if, if you'll indulge me, and I'll start here. Mr. Montgomery writes, the problem with the Confederate flag and the granite statues of dead soldiers is that the Civil War never ended. It devolved into skirmishes and entanglements. As Nicole Hannah Jones has written, it morphed into looser legal forms of enslavement that are just as damaging as the whip. It rages on Facebook and in classrooms and in the streets of American cities still. In Sculpting a Better Nation, isn't Sculpting a Better Nation something akin to chiseling a figure from stone? So we look to past improvements of our shared experience for comfort, to Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the Cleveland Avenue bus in Montgomery, Alabama on December 1st, 1955, to the nine teenagers who enrolled at Little Rock Central High School in 1957, to the four college students refusing to vacate a lunch counter at Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina on February 1st, 1960, to the march by 600 activ activists across the Edmund Pettus Bridge through tear gas and billy clubs near Selma, Alabama on March 7th, 1965, known as Bloody Sunday, to Martin Luther King Jr. on April 3rd, 1968, the evening before he was assassinated, telling striking Memphis sanitation workers that he had been to the mountaintop. These things we know and celebrate and memorialize, but there are thousands of forgotten events and people upon whose bones those brave activists stood. Their stories aren't as accessible because they played out after the Civil War and before the sustained civil rights movement at a time when there was little interest in preserving the stories and customs of African-Americans. The recorded history of that period is white. And I'll conclude with this last sentence. The experience reminded me that our violent past is still with us and that we face a reckoning, ready or not. Again, that's from the preface of A Shot in the Moonlight, written by Ben Montgomery, which is a wonderful story about a, a freed slave uh, and a former Confederate soldier and a governor, a fairly kind of uh, open-minded Kentucky governor and how they challenged some of the institutions of the Jim Crow South uh, in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. And so with that, is my, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce author uh, and journalist Ben Montgomery, Mr. Montgomery. I, I, you're I muted. You're muted, word. Ben. Of course I am. That's how I like to start these things, to keep everybody on their toes, uh, just opening up with the tech issue. Thank you, Dean Mohammed. It's, uh, it, it's such a pleasure to join you all today and, uh, and certainly to join this uh, esteemed group of, of folks who brought this event together. I am in your debt in many ways. Um, this started, uh, this book is a, is a product of uh, my own experiences as a newspaper journalist working on a project uh, uh, about uh, police shootings. Um, and so, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. I wanted to open up though, by just reading uh, the first couple of pages of this book, the opening chapter to kind of give you a flavor of, of how this uh, sounds, how I wrote it, and um, to set the stage for uh, a short telling of so the rest of the story. Um, so if you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes. <clears throat> uh, uh, this is chapter one, the whites would be bent on revenge. Uh, and the, the dateline is January 21st, 1897. When the guns fell silent and the white men took cover, George Denning burst out the back of his little wooden house, wearing only his undergarments. He ran through the frigid January air 
and when he reached the tall grass of a nearby field, he hurled himself down flat on his back, his lungs heaving, his breath visible and rising beneath a moon almost full and what seemed to be a million stars poking through a smoky blue-black midnight sky. He lay still and quiet and listened to the men's voices coming from the north beyond the house. They sounded at first as though they were in a state of consternation, but the voices grew distant as time slid by, suggesting retreat. When he could no longer hear the voices over the heartbeat in his own ears, he sat up slowly, looked around, then darted across the field toward his house. His wife met him at the door with his boots, his heavy coat, and his hat, and he dressed quickly without saying much, then turned away from the humble home he had built with his own hands, the only home his children had ever known, the home he had defended, and he disappeared into the darkness. And I'll uh, just leave it right there. Um, uh, this book, uh, A Shot in the Moonlight, tells a story of a man named George Denning, who was born in 1855 into slavery, um, whose first public record uh, acknowledged uh, his life, his first ever created public record acknowledged uh, a couple of things, that he was five years old, that he was male, and that he was black. There was no name associated with him in the slave roster, uh, just those uh, uh, demographic identifiers, five years old, male, and black. Um, uh, he uh, eventually uh, was emancipated, as were uh, other Kentucky uh, uh, folks who were born into slavery. Um, and he went about, he never left the area. He stayed in Simpson County, Kentucky, where he was born uh, and raised. He started to make his own family. He got married. He eventually legally purchased from the man who used to enslave him. He legally purchased about 114 acres, uh, paying that bill off over uh, several years. And he began to farm that acreage. It was on the banks of the Red River in southwestern Kentucky in this very fertile area of farmland and rolling hills. Um, and he got along. It, there, was no, uh, there was no issue in his life that we know of that at least created such a wave that it, it might have entered the public record uh, before this night, January 27th, 19, uh, sorry, 1897. Um, he built his own cabin with his hands. He began raising a family. He, uh, he and his wife had 11 children. About half of them were asleep in his home one night. January of 1897, when 25 white men, half of them carrying guns, most of them his neighbors, rode up to his property late that night and demanded that he come out. Um, this was in an era when lynching went down like clockwork. It was uh, constant news in the South. Um, you know, nearly every day's newspaper had the story about some lynching in some place, uh, mostly in the rural South. Um, and George Denning on, on the night in question refused to come out. No wonder, right? Uh, he asked who was outside. The men refused to identify themselves. They wouldn't tell him their names. One of them disguised his voice and held a handkerchief over his mouth. Um, you know, if he could have seen outside, he would have seen men dressed against the cold air. He would not have seen any KKK caps. That wasn't a thing in that era. He would not have seen any identifiers on, on these farmers and these other men who, who were there uh, to suggest there were any kind of uh, an organized group, except that they were neighbors and they farmed the same uh, territory together. So they refused to come out. Um, when he asked what, what they wanted there, uh, they said that he had been stealing. They accused him of stealing, uh, taking some uh, livestock from neighboring farms, they had suspected him also of setting fire to a couple of smokehouses in the area. Um, he protested and said that he didn't do any of that and that he had good upstanding white neighbors who could vouch for him, vouch for his character. And he offered to go fetch them, but the men refused. And during uh, this short conversation, someone opened fire in the rear of his house and a bullet came sailing through his back door. And this uh, created um, a, a chaotic scene. The men in the front of the house began firing their weapons. Uh, George Denning um, uh, ran upstairs. And by the way, I should mention this is about five years after the famous muckraking journalist Ida B. Wells, who was a victim of uh, many crimes over her lifetime and witnessed many terrible lynchings and the destruction that lynching can bring to a community. Uh, she had uh, encouraged 
um, uh, black people that she knew, those who read her words, to bear arms. She had said, uh, in fact, a Winchester rifle deserves a place of honor in every black home to provide uh, protection that the law refuses to provide. This is in the face of, again, a, a ritual, a pattern of the lynching of black people in the South. And so Ida B. Wells' call to arms was encouraging black people to, to at least have a gun and be ready because the law is not gonna protect you against the mob. So George Dinning had a shotgun and he grabbed his and he started to run upstairs in his cabin. And as he passed a window, he took a bullet in the left arm. It grazed his left arm. He made it to the top of the stairs, and ran across the room and threw open the shutters. And um, as he leaned out the window, a bullet grazed his forehead. He was about an inch from being killed immediately. And just as he leaned out the window he and the bullet grazes his forehead, he has time to squeeze off one shot. And that bird shot that was loaded in the barrel of his shotgun struck and killed the 32-year-old scion of the wealthiest farm family in southwestern Kentucky, a man named Jody Kahn. Um, Denning uh, immediately knew his life was in danger. Uh, so after the shot was fired and after the shooting died down outside, and by the way, there was an enormous volley of shots fired after, after Denning fired his, uh, nobody was hit inside the house, but as soon as the shooting died down and as soon as the coast seemed to be clear, George Denning took off running. And this is the scene that I, that I just read you in this book. This death uh, set in motion a series of events that to this day remain sensational and, and, um, uh, and a fascinating, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, an important, I argue, uh, moment in our history, in our shared history. George Denning turned himself in uh, the following morning, as soon as he found out he had killed Jody Khan, with whom he had no beef whatsoever, uh, who he actually considered a friend and a neighbor, um, Denning turned himself into the local sheriff and threw himself essentially at that time at the mercy of the system. And this was a brave act. Maybe it was brave. Maybe he had no other option. Uh, we don't know, unfortunately, what was going on in his head at the time. But he uh, had previous dealings with the sheriff, and maybe there was a chance he trusted the sheriff to take care of him. But he must have known at the time that if, uh, you know, if he turned himself in and the sheriff couldn't protect him from a lynch mob, then he was big, you know, he, he was in big trouble. The sheriff, as it turns out, was not um, what was not one of these who rolled over, uh, which happened very frequently in the South, who rolled over to men with guns who stood outside demanding of, you know, a hostage or a prisoner. Uh, this sheriff uh, decided immediately that Denning's life was in danger and he needed to be moved to the closest, uh, bigger city where he could provide protection. And so he loaded him secretly into a carriage and took him across the country 20 miles to Bowling Green. He stayed there for a few days. Word spread that a mob was organizing back in Simpson County. The same men who had been at his house that day uh, had returned to his home that evening. And uh, I'm sorry, the same men who were there that evening had returned to his home the next morning trying to find him, no doubt. And when they couldn't, they held his family hostage for the rest of the day. And as night fell, uh, they demanded his wife take all of their children on two horses and ride 50 miles without stopping. They said, leave the state of Kentucky and don't turn around until you're gone. And so uh, she did at gunpoint. And as soon as she and the kids started to ride away, these same men or neighbors of George Dennings set fire to his house and his barns and his gear house and to his fields. And so everything that Denning had, uh, uh, everything of monetary value was destroyed in that moment. The uh, situation in Bowling Green got so difficult that the jailer decided the only way he could protect George Denning's life from a lynch mob was if uh, he armed the other prisoners. And so the sheriff expecting an attack passed out guns, if you can imagine this, to the other prisoners in the event the mob broke through the front door. That never happened and, and eventually he was uh, uh, taken away to serve the rest of his time in, in Louisville to await trial in Louisville. Uh, this, um, this pause created an interesting uh, set of circumstances. The members of the lynch party, uh, the, member, the men who showed up at George Denning's house uh, that evening in order to bring uh, a conviction, in order to bring a charge against George Denning, uh, 
had to testify that, to the fact that they were at his home, right? That they had witnessed this exchange of gunfire. They had to testify to the fact that many of them were bearing arms. They had to testify to the fact that they rode up to their home, to, to their neighbor's home, uh, you know, close to midnight on a cold night when you don't just customarily pay a visit to a friend. Um, and so in order to bring a charge against George Denning for the death of their friend, Jody Kahn, they had to out themselves as at a minimum members of some sort of posse who had gone late one night to try to discourage at a minimum to discourage their neighbor from stealing uh, anymore. Um, now, they tried to they tried to fool everybody, suggesting that they were on a peacekeeping mission and they were just there to warn him away um, when, uh, you know, none of the other circumstances suggest that that was the case. You don't go try to have a conversation with your friend and your neighbor uh, that late at night and you don't go with 25 white guys, all of you or half of you bearing, bearing arms. Um, so uh, so these guys, it took them a while to eventually come out and tell the district attorney uh, what they had witnessed and that George Denning had um, had killed uh, their friend with his gunshot. Uh, once they did, Denning, of course, was charged. Uh, the charge at first was murder. Um, he was brought back that July. This all happened in January. He was brought back that July to face trial. Of course, it was an all white jury. Um, you know, it was just recently the case that black people were given the opportunity to even testify in state court in Kentucky. Um, so everything that was playing, playing out had a, had a uh, you know, sort of a se sense of newness. Um, it was an incredibly hot summer. The governor of Kentucky, by the way, enters the picture uh, at, this, at this time because he is a progressive governor. He is elected with the black vote. He is a Republican. Um, uh, he rides in this interesting wave of uh, progressive politics into Southern um, uh, people's houses. And, uh, and he decides he's going to dedicate himself to doing what he can to try to keep George Denning safe. So as Denning was moved from jail to jail, the governor was dispatching telegraphs on the regular, asking the jailers what he can do to provide support to keep Denning safe sending wires to Denning's lawyers, public, public, public defendants, uh, suggesting that he was there to help if they, needed, if they needed anything. And they did eventually call upon him. Meanwhile, the governor started uh, doing what he could backstage to pass anti-lynching legislation, which uh, lynching had become such an issue in the South that it brought, about, um, uh, it brought out some people who might not otherwise be concerned with lynching were it not for the negative economic impact upon the state. And so, and I think the governor kind of, although, you know, there's evidence that he really cared deeply about the lives and, and well-being of Black people, there's also evidence that he wanted to bring business dollars to, and tourism dollars to the state of Kentucky. And it's hard to do when you're, you know, when, 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 when everybody has blood on their hands. Um, and so uh, those factors were at work when he starts to pass, the, or try to pass this anti-lynching legislation. Um, is another fellow who's paying attention to this trial, and he's a fascinating guy. His name is Colonel Bennett Young. Uh, Young joined the Confederacy when he was a teenager. He was born into a, a wealthy family. His father owned a number of, of slaves, young uh, enslaved people. Young would have grown up with these enslaved people. Um, and as soon as he could, at the end of his private school education, at the age of 16 or 17, he signed up to fight uh, for the South. He was a son of the South. Um, he uh, uh, joined up with Morgan's men who did those interesting raids into the north, into Ohio and Illinois and some into Indiana. Um, eventually, Young's claim to fame was that he, uh, after being imprisoned in Camp Douglas in Chicago, he escaped from that jail and he convinced the Confederate administration to let him try to attack from Canada. And so he organized a band of young Confederate soldiers and they pretended they were sportsmen. And they rode down south out of Canada into a small town called New Albans, Vermont, uh, pretending to be tourists. And they asked the townsfolk to show them where the guns were kept and show them where the stables were so they could get horses. And then the next day at high noon, they pulled out their weapons and held the town hostage for about 24 hours before riding out of town with somewhere near $200,000. So Young, uh, after the war, went to Ireland, got a law degree and came back to practice law in Louisville.
And after the war, he um, takes a deep interest in the well being of African Americans in the state of Kentucky and really specifically in the city of Louisville um, to include befriending another, uh, a number of African American ministers and businessmen, founding or helped fa help found uh, a, an orphanage for black children, and also taking on the cases of black men and women who needed access to the civil courts. And this was a regular practice for young. And so when he was reading about this sensational set of events going on down in southwestern Kentucky, he grew interested and, um, and started paying attention on a regular basis. Denning was, of course, convicted uh, by a jury. The surprise was that he was convicted of manslaughter, which is a lesser crime than murder, which is what he was originally charged with. But he was convicted nonetheless, despite testimony from his family that um, he had responded when Guns were fired into his house, despite the evidence that he had been shot in the forehead inside of his own house and shot in the arm inside of his own house, despite his 12-year-old daughter's testimony that bullets flew through her hair as the guns were being fired outside. He was convicted of manslaughter for defending his home. This sparked outrage among Kentuckians, both white and black. And one of the most incredible things in this whole story is this, the number of people who came out from all walks of life to stand in defense of George Denning. And they wrote letters to the governor and to the, to the editors of the newspaper saying, what has happened is a travesty and an injustice. This man was doing, whether he was black or white, he was doing what he could to defend his home and to defend his family. And the governor listened to all this and they begged the governor for a pardon after Denning was convicted. And he listened. And the day after Denning was uh, sent to Eddyville State Penitentiary, uh, the governor sent word that he had been pardoned and uh, sent him a one-way ticket to Louisville, hoping that he would resettle with his family. Once, um, once Denning made it to Louisville, he was celebrated by the African-American community in Louisville. He went on a speaking circuit of Black churches who uh, supported him. They had been supporting him, but they took up offerings to help get his family on their feet. Uh, at some point, he sent for his family who came and joined him in Louisville, and they moved across the Mason-Dixon line across the Ohio River to Jeffersonville, Kentucky, which sits just on the northern bank uh, across the Ohio from Louisville. And they started to make a life there. They got a small home and um, uh, the kids were relocated. Interestingly, in family lore, by the way, as an aside, uh, when, when um, George's wife, Molly, and the kids show up to get uh, escorted across the river to make their way across the Ohio, the family tells it that they, they did so hidden inside of barrels, and they don't know anything more than that. Unfortunately, the folklore is sort of unwound a little bit, so the details are few, but they had to be secreted, evidently, across uh, the Ohio River, which is an interesting thing because slavery had long since ended, but that point was uh, an end of the Underground Railroad. Uh, many uh, uh, freed slaves or running slaves had been um, had been, uh, uh, you know, had gotten into the North, had escaped the South right at that juncture, uh, uh, you know, there, there at Louisville, and they made their homes in the free state of Indiana. So, um, so Denning uh, uh, is on the speaking circuit. The newspapers find out that he has been talking to a lawyer about bringing a lawsuit against uh, the lyncher, the would-be lynchers, against these guys who burned his his house down and set fire to his fields because he had nothing uh, besides what the churches had raised for him. And he had spent his whole life in his mid forties, he'd spent his whole life working uh, to, you know, to get to this point. Now he's got nothing to show for it. And so, um, so word gets out and it, it makes it back to Simpson County, Kentucky and neighboring Logan County where Jody Kahn, the dead man was from. And the newspapers write about this in such an overtly racist way uh, and make threats in between the lines that he should get what, you know, what's coming to him. I don't remember reading the word uppity, but it's flavored in there, you know, it's, it's, it's coded in. Um, and so, uh, and so about two weeks after this, especially repugnant editorial runs in the Franklin favorite back home, um, somebody catches George Denning in an alley in Louisville at nighttime, uh, breaks open his head with a brick, gouges out one of his eyes and leaves him for dead. He's taken uh, by ambulance to the local hospital where he is treated and recovers from these 
terrible injuries, including a skull fracture and a completely uh, removed eye, which he loses. Um, so, you know, you pause there for a second and, 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 and think about the implication of that and how difficult this next thing might be. Uh, it really brings the power of this story home. Uh, Dinning uh, teams up with Bennett Young, this former Confederate war hero, and they file suit in federal court against uh, 25 men, uh, all the men whose names they could come by who were in the crowd that night standing outside of his home. Um, and this uh, starts a legal battle that Young is, has spent his life preparing for. Young is an orator of great skill. And uh, when called to deliver arguments on Dinning's behalf, he has uh, great success in wooing the jury. And at risk of uh, giving away the climax of the book, um, I'll tell you that um, George Denning got what he was asking for. And, um, and in some ways it's viewed, uh, <clears throat> you know, by guys like me looking at this many, many years later as uh, some form of justice. But I pose this question to Denning's family, his descendants, who've been cool enough to join me on some of these calls. I said, do you guys feel like what he got was justice looking back at what he went through? And to a person, they said, no, not at all. You know, we lost our home. That was 114 acres that was ours. And they said, uh, no matter what reward he got in court, um, you know, it, it, nothing could bring that back uh, except returning that land to us. And I'm happy and interested to report today that much like this fascinating case that's playing out in California with the Bruce Beach uh, property, if you're aware of that, the Dinning family has tried to decide to find a lawyer who might be willing to um, figure out the difficult property record issues involved in suing for that property back, whoever the current owner might be. Um, so there's still legal machinations at work in this case that played out uh, you know, in the late 1890s. And to wrap up and, uh, you know, take some questions, um, Young went on to uh, do more than any man of his time, maybe any man in history, to promote and support uh, the idea of the valor of the lost cause Confederacy. Um, he, he spoke at the, he gave the eulogy at Minnie Davis's uh, memorial service, the daughter of Jefferson Davis, the founder of the Daughters of the Confederate Veterans. Uh, he raised money for the Jefferson Davis Monument, the lar largest phallic monument outside of D.C. Um, he gave the keynote addresses at the unveiling of many of our, uh, uh, you know, of many of the, of the Confederate statues that right now we are trying to decide what to do with. Uh, these all came about in the early 1900s, the early 20th century, and, and most of them had Young's fingerprints on them. He either raised money for them or he, uh, you know, delivered a, a moving uh, lost cause address, um, you know, when, when they were unveiled. Beyond that, he wrote, um, he wrote several books late in life, including one that maybe did more than most to uh, try to promote the lost cause. And that was called Confederate Wizards of the Saddle, which is like 600 pages of stories of the valor of Confederate soldiers. Um, so you have in him a very complex guy who founded a, an orphanage for Black children, who successfully represented George Denning and many others similarly situated, and then who also at the same time promoted this idea that this was about states' rights and that uh, the Confederate soldiers deserve to be honored in death. Um, and those two things uh, I thought of before as like existing on opposite ends of this spectrum, but I'm not so sure that's the case. And I'm not, I don't have answers for this, but um, I, th I think, um, you know, with the, the growth of the second clan in like the 19 teens and 1920s and the co-opting, the total co-opting of the Southern cause, uh, uh, for, you know, to uh, um, essentially uh, be a show of uh, uh, racist white supremacy, um, uh, you know, further complicates the things that George, that Bennett Young might have done in his lifetime that would have been good and equitable and in pursuit of justice. Um, so it's an interesting thing to unpack. Young, unfortunately, outside of his books, didn't leave behind many papers or didn't leave them behind where, where I could find them. And so uh, some of what 
you know, some of his turning points in life, his internal uh, uh, turning points are a little difficult to figure out, but, um, but fascinating characters. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is, uh, you know, in 1864, the New York Times wrote this editorial that I thought was important enough to include in the book, part of it. And it essentially makes, this is as the Civil War rages, uh, it essentially makes the case that the men of our day, this is 1864, the men of our day uh, won't be remembered for any of the political things that they're doing right now. Um, everybody's, the people of the future will forget that. And a hundred years from now, the only thing that's going to matter for us is how we came down on that one great important question of our time, uh, the issue of slavery. And isn't that true? Isn't that where we are right now in history that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, July of last year, uh, former President Donald Trump stood in front of Mount Rushmore in this very sort of jingoistic way, in this coded way, was racist coded way, uh, spoke of, um, you know, how we need to remember, we white people is what he's saying, but we need to remember our past and don't let them take that away from us and don't let them try to dissolve it and dilute it. And he's standing, he's delivering these words in front of a monument that pays homage to two men who owned other human beings. And, uh, and, and that's, I think, where we are today. And, and it's why I think this book is timely, even though it came out, uh, sorry, even though it was you know, dealing with an event that it happened in um, 1897. It's because this was the birth, if you will, a birth, if you will, of the same issues that we're as a as a community trying to work through today. So um, I am more than happy to entertain discussion, comments, uh, anything at all. Thank thank you so much, Ben Montgomery, for this wonderful book. Um, one of the things I just got to say that stood out is um, the history. It's so much history. Um, you not only talked about the the uh, case, but you talked about all the history around what was going on then, and it was, you know, you were absorbing all kinds of different things as you explained this story about this man and, and his survival, pretty much survival. survival. At the same time, they were, we brought in lots of history, lots, and, and the one thing that I got is the financial part of it. There was always a financial side of what was going on, which is, you know, the world we live in, um, the numbers of non-Blacks that came to his rescue were huge. Um, the, the big thing that stood out to me was Confederate officers. Mm -hmm. So many Confederate officers stepped up to the plate and did the right thing. And, and there was a real transition of uh, doing the right thing, not only to him, but to the country at that time. It was, and, and like you said, it was very complicated because Kentucky, folks in Kentucky were fighting on what side of the war they're gonna be on. That's one thing they had going on. And a, mo and a lot of them went to the Confederacy, but at, in this book, you see so many of those Confederates doing the right thing because right. it was the right thing to do and and and, and like you said um young wow what a complicated individual that, that guy was um went to canada did the the most northern attack on the union than anybody in history and then comes back from europe and becomes this lawyer fighting for the cause of the black man, which is just amazing. So uh, thank you so much for this book. I know uh, Rafik has a million questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him jump in here right now, but thank you for the book. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you thank you for, uh, for that commentary and toss, Dan. Um, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Just, um, you know, one of the things I really loved about this book is the narrative thread is continuous, right? It's, it's, it's the story of George Dinning, and 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 you know his you know relationship with these other kind of two primary characters, especially uh, Bennett Young, but they're all of these other I don't want to call them subtle subtle themes, but these other kind of tangential threads yes, yes. that really kind of paint this wonderful picture of everything that was going on then. But as I said earlier, like connect us to some of the debates we're still having. Um, 
And, and so I, I guess, you know, the, the first question I have, and I, I wanted to remind everyone who's here that the Q&A is open. So if you have questions uh, for Mr. Montgomery, you're welcome to put them into the Q&A uh, and, and we'll try to get to those. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to ask some questions of my own, right? And, and I won't try to monopolize too much. But I guess the first kind of general question is that I have is, um, is you talked about, you know, your motivation for writing the book, right? You talked about looking at uh, police shootings, for example, as something that kind of got you to think about this. Um, I, I wonder if you could just, you know, I, I, I would think that there are a number of different ways you could have approached this story. And so I, 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 the question I have is like, what other, what other approach were you considering? Like, uh, what, was this the only narrative, the only way you could tell this story? Or was there another way you were thinking about it? And this one kind of took over? How, how, how did you come about the process of choosing this particular thread to tell the story, uh, yeah. if you don't mind sharing that? Yeah, not at all. I appreciate the question. And uh, let me just give like a little bit more uh, on the genesis of this, and maybe it helps answer that question. Uh, I was, I came into the, I was a newspaper guy uh, for years and years, but I, 2013, I think, uh, the shooting, right after the shooting of um, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, uh, right after that happened, I had read an editorial in the Washington Post that said, um, it's unfortunate that we, uh, that nobody keeps track of the number of times police shoot individuals in the United States. And that right now is common knowledge. But at that point, and I read the paper every day, at that point in time, that was the first I had ever heard of this. I had just done a story about the number of purse snatchings in Florida, like the Florida Department of Law Enforcement could tell me how many times a purse got snatched in Florida, but they couldn't tell me how many times an officer, a licensed officer of the law in the state of Florida shot a citizen. Nobody had that number. And there are reasons for that. Uh, but uh, we don't want to get into that right now. But I was angry. And I came to this meeting. And I said, how can we know if we have a problem? Or, or you know, ha nobody can say if police are shooting more blacks than whites. Nobody could say that without the numbers. We can make guesses based on what we see, but nobody could say that without the numbers. So how, as a society, do you move forward without the data? And I'm mad about this in the staff meeting and my boss, God bless him, he said, do that story. Tell me how many people get shot by police in the state of Florida. And I, of course, you, you know, bit off way more than I could chew. Three years later, having asked 400 police departments in the state of Florida for six years worth of records, anytime a police officer shot a gun and somebody was injured or killed, we could tell you that there were 831 citizens shot by police in Florida, about 135 a year, every single year, one every 3.2 days, uh, an officer of the law in Florida shoots somebody. And we could tell you that 40% of those people were black. People shot by police, 40% were black compared with uh, African-Americans make up about 15% of the state's population in Florida. And so that's way out of whack. But that took three years just to get there and just for one state. And I remain upset about this, that it's been the case for a long time that we just refuse to acknowledge in numbers and studies, um, we refuse to acknowledge this uh, uh, systemic racism that it's so important to so many people. People are marching in the streets right now. Uh, and, and it's because we just perpetually refuse to come to terms with these problems. And counting is fundamental to how you address, begin to address or think about a problem, right? Counting. And we didn't do that until very recently. Um, so I, ha so I, I had that anger driving me. And then uh, I spent so much time inside of these reports, and they and most of them end in tragedy, a big chunk of them could have been prevented and should have been prevented uh, for any number of reasons. And I'm, I'm reading uh, about lives ended, about young black male lives ended um, every day. And I'm meeting uh, the mothers of these most, mostly young black men and, um, and I'm stepping into their world and trying to understand how that violence traumatizes them and how that you know, plays out in their lives. And, uh, and also to write about the fight that they're engaged in to try to bring attention specifically to the death of their loved one and then to try to stop this, this, uh, this thing that's affecting so many of us. And so in all of this, 
I uh, started to wonder and maybe even long for a story that didn't end in tragedy because um, I felt like it would allow all of us uh, maybe, uh, this is very personal. I try to think of myself as my audience, you know, but I, I thought it might give us a chance to talk about these very important things. And then also to like, want, you know, recognize uh, this story that didn't have a, a terrible tragic ending that had actually like a, it's not beautiful, it's not clean. Uh, as I just mentioned, it's not necessarily just even, but it is a victory. And no matter how you cut it, it is a victory for the courts and for America that he won. And so, um, and so, uh, you know, I wanted that breath of fresh air and I thought we could all use that. And so I started looking for a story that might help me uh, that might give me a, a vehicle to tell that. And by the way, in the middle of this, as I'm like considering some things, I visited the incredibly powerful, uh, which uh, museum that is, I'm forgetting the, the specific name of it, but it's colloquially called the Lynching Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And if you've ever been there, you know that you start off eye level with these, with these coffin-sized metal boxes that are suspended from the roof. And as you walk through, and each one is inscribed with the name of a Southern County, well, there's some Northern counties maybe, uh, each one is inscribed with the name of an American County, and then the name of everyone who's lynched in that County. And as you start, you're on eye level with these names, with these boxes. And as you pass through the, the memorial, they uh, eventually are, you go down and they're eventually suspended up of you, uh, up above you. And I had this, uh, this moment of um, uh, power uh, experiencing that where I nearly lost my feet by the gravity of uh, the names of 4,400 victims of lynching in the United States. And I, um, with that history in my mind, I started thinking about uh, the names that weren't on those boxes and not people who didn't, whose death didn't get noticed because there are likely hundreds of those, but people who escaped uh, by the, by the skin of their teeth or by good fortune or, you know, by luck or what, or by their own courage and defense um, and taking up arms. Uh, and then, and then afterwards went seeking justice and got it like a, a story about vengeance or, um, revenge, not to suggest that that was the case in, in you know, with George Dinning, but um, I was looking for this story and, and, uh, and I'm, I feel lucky to have found it. You know, it's, it's not completely forgotten. It comes up every once in a while. The Associated Press wrote a little bit about it in 2001 uh, as a part of a bigger package on the theft of land from African Americans at the turn of the century. It's a huge issue. Hundreds of thousands of acres were stolen. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, this, I, I, I felt like uh, fit the bill. If I had a hesitancy, not to dom dominate this whole thing, but it was that I have white skin and uh, I'll just be candid about this as possible. I asked my, my literary agent for whom I've, with, with whom I've worked on three past books, I said, is this an issue? Um, should it be an issue? And she said, I, I'm not sure. She was uncertain about it. So I talked to friends uh, I, I ran it by some really smart people, um, uh, and ultimately, I, I reached out to the Dinning family. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to track them down. It took me a, a while because Dinning, once he uh, left the state of Kentucky, he changed his name to D-E-N-N-I-N-G, so slight, slightly different spelling, but I eventually connected with, uh, with his family, and they welcomed me in, and we had that conversation. Is this okay that I'm this guy who's trying to tell your great grandfather's story. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have done it without, um, without their, uh, blessing. And so, um, yeah, that's my response. Well, thank you for that. And, and you, you kind of, you suggest in the book, um, uh, that inspired a whole another list of questions, by the way. So uh, and don't worry about dominating it's, Hey, it's your show, but uh, you, you, you mentioned in the book, even um, you speculate as to why George Denning changed his name from Denning to Denning. Right. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll allow you to say that if you, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, his, uh, so we don't know exactly. Unfortunately, he, he never, um, could never read or write. And so what exists on the public record uh, about him is always from someone else's perspective. 
It's always, or him being quoted in a newspaper article or something like that. So unfortunately, between the family lore and what exists on the public record, we don't know his specific reason for changing the name. But it was pretty common for folks to, uh, who had gotten out of, you know, who, who had been emancipated uh, or had left a certain situation, uh, eschewed their last name by changing it from, um, you know, from the name of the person who uh, owned them um, or, you know, sometimes signifying that with an X before the name. And I think that would come, come about later, become more common later, certainly. Uh, and so, you know, whatever the case, or it could have been, you know, trying to get out of the public spotlight because there was a while there, this case was sensational. The New York Times hired a correspondent to cover it. There are many newspaper reporters in the courtroom when all of this was playing out. And so it could have been uh, trying to get, you know, get, find a way to get out of the public spotlight just to live his life peacefully, uh, you know, after he relocated to, to um, Jeffersonville. Uh, ben, I think you covered it in your book. Uh, you said that when, after the beating, when he went to the hospital because of his condition, the nurses put his name, spelled his name wrong, which took the reporters three days to find him. That's because right. they didn't know it was the actual Denning who had gotten beat up. So I think it was the nurses who changed his name as opposed to him changing his name. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're reminding me of that, uh, that nugget. Isn't that interesting? Uh, yeah, yeah, now you, you mentioned, um, you, so I'll go back to something you said just a second ago instead of some of these other pressing questions that I have. But you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the, the scope of the victory, right? And again, not trying to give away the ending of the book because it, it is like a page turner in that way, right? Uh, and, and I love how you kind of bring it to the present in, in the final chapter. I think that that's just remarkable. Um, uh, but you, you mentioned the scope of the victory and, and how it's not an absolute victory. And I'm not going to push back on you. It's your book. I, but I do think, you know, looking at the context of that time, uh, you know, and, and even like then tying in what you just said about the New York Times sending a correspondent down there to cover this, you know, one has to think, number one, that if there wasn't this much public attention, there's no way that the outcome would have been as just as it was in, in either instance, right? Why the, whether it be the criminal uh, proceeding or, or, or the civil proceedings, right? But, um, but also uh, still, like, it was, at least my understanding of it, uh, it was such an anomaly, right? Where where even like fundamental questions of justice could be considered because some of the things that come up in, and you, you, again, this is like some of the beautiful little kind of tangential pieces in this book. Like you talk about, for example, you just mentioned, it's like a, it's like a throwaway line almost, but you mention uh, the fact that he's, he, he's tried before an all white jury. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and while, you know, most people, you know, I, I guess, you know, a lot of people would say, well, what's wrong with that, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and, and you also mentioned Ida B. Wells and uh, her, her argument about a Winchester rifle and everything else. You know, these are fundamental, like the Second Amendment that people cling so dearly to, or, you know, the due process clause and, and, of, of the Fifth Amendment and then the Fourteenth Amendment, all that other kind of stuff. Like, these are things that, like values that we say are fundamentally American, but historically have been systematically denied to Black people, right? So in the case of like a jury, a, a Sixth Amendment, a, you know, trial and jury by your peers or whatever, you know, that's something that, you know, Black people were, sit, were by law excluded from serving on either grand juries or trial juries uh, throughout most of the history of this country after, even after slavery. And then it wasn't until the 1980s in, in, uh, in Kentucky, <laughs> where, you know, finally uh, the Supreme Court ruled that preemptory challenges, for example, can't be used just to create an all-white jury when you have a Black defendant. Which is wild. And so there's just like this, these kinds of things in the book, I just think are amazingly powerful. And, and I, I think, you know, would, would cause someone who's reading it or listening to it or, or whatever the case may be to kind of think about how all of these other things are connected. And I do want to bring it back to one thing that, that you mentioned. You mentioned the, the lynching museum um, and, and, and the number, just the sheer number, there's 4,400 folks uh, who have been known to have been lynched, right? And, and, and I, I hadn't even thought about the people who got away. Um, but... But I, I, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, because I think, I think Dinning's story kind of tells this too. And then I have one other question about property loss and, and then I'll leave you alone for a while. But, 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 he, uh, but, but talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about kind of what you see as the, the purpose of lynching uh, uh, in, in that period, you know, like, like what was its function? Yeah, well, uh, well I think um, 
I, I wrote about uh, an unsolved lynching in 1934 in Mariana, Florida. This is much later than the George Denning thing played out, but uh, it involved 5,000 people who had driven from nine Southern states to participate. And um, so uh, I think lynching served a couple of different purposes. If they were uh, those big kind of spectacle lynchings, uh, I, th I think that is uh, human barbarism and sadism and mob uh, insanity. Um, I don't know how else uh, to explain that sort of situation. Maybe some people who have, uh, some academics have studied this, no doubt, but, uh, you know, I read descriptions of that 1934 lynching of Claude Neal that kids who were two years old poked his corpse with sticks. And I don't know how you bring your two-year-old uh, in any age in which, you know, we have not, we weren't barbaric like that during the Civil War, for heaven's sakes, right? Uh, we weren't, we, we weren't, we didn't bring our two-year-olds to poke sticks uh, at, at corpses in 1776. Like, there was no graduation from that. That is um, impossible for me to understand. Uh, so, but those often uh, were meant to scare everybody who saw anything about it in the newspaper or on the radio or later on on television um they were meant to just send fear into the hearts of uh you know of, of black people across america um the ones on a smaller scale uh were often about theft they were often about property theft and if you could you know uh accuse someone of a crime like George Denning, they accused him, they, they didn't even name uh, the, the property owner who allegedly was violated. They wouldn't, that never came out, not at trial, not while they were having a conversation with him. So I think it was made up more than likely, or they would have said, we've got Farmer McGee here. He says that it was you who stole his chickens. You know what I mean? And that never, that was not part of uh, the case at all. And so I think they were there to get his land. And I think if he didn't go willingly, then they were going to kill him and hope that they were above the law. And I think that was representative of a lot of lynchings. Uh, you know, the bigger ones send a message. And I write about some of these but send a message and let let every black man and woman and child in the South know, uh, you know, the, the threat and the danger that exists for them. And then the smaller ones were we want your property. Or we want your things and uh, you can't stop us from taking them. And you touch on that when you talk about earlier that day, he had worked side by side with the same men that came to his house that night. Side by side. They, yeah. were, they had worked together. They knew who he was. And, 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 and that makes sense that they were after his land because they had worked side by side. He was a good man. They knew he was. And, and, I, and one thing I want to talk, touch on before uh, Rafiq goes further is I think a big part of this case was the fact that Denning was well spoken. Yeah. And so as he went through the legal system, because he was well spoken, it was hard to one of the lawyers went after him with a vengeance. Yeah. Asked him question after question after question after question. And he stuck to his guns because he was well spoken. And that infuriated the, the the lawyer as and and Denning went on to give public speaking he was so well spoken right yeah I, I think you're right and it uh you know the and the and the fifth street baptist church in louisville sent him a suit um and there's some indication to me that he wouldn't have been able to come by a suit of clothes that looked quite like that uh just just by his own, his own means. He was living too close to the earth for that and would have no need for it, right? Uh, but, you know, the picture that ran in the newspapers was him in a three-piece suit. He was looking handsome. He was, his posture was good. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, I, I think uh, those things probably um, helped him with some of his access. And, uh, and then beyond that, you know, um, Dean Muhammad was talking a little bit about this earlier, but like, I think this tested maybe our most fundamental law, which is the castle doctrine set up all those years ago in, you know, medieval times. Um, like you can't do anything to me if I'm inside my own house, I am safe in here. And as, as a, you know, it's so foundational, it's not, 
written into the Constitution, right? I mean, it is, I guess, a little bit here and there, but you can't violate my premises. You can't come in here and attack me because this is my house and I can defend my house. And so a lot of the uh, support for Denning uh, acknowledged that fundamental founding democratic principle that like private property is above all uh, defendable. And, uh, and so a lot, of, and a lot of people acknowledge this, even like the editorials, they would say things like, well, you know, he might be a desperado. Uh, he, you know, uh, uh, it, was, it was racist. Uh, he might be a no good desperado, these kinds of things. But that night, he was just defending himself and his family and his house, and every person has that right. Uh, so it was a test of that. So as, as racist as some of the people might have been at that time, they recognize the value of that law, no matter who you are. And if they and if we say that this, you know, the 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 castle doctrine does not apply to people of color, Lord have mercy. Can you imagine the chaos? And often that was the case. Uh, you know, I, a part of this, I studied the history of of policing in America, and you learn very quickly that the northern style of policing with the colonists was like. Um, the watchman style from the UK, from, from, from Great Britain. It was a volunteer effort and a guy kind of walked around and he was a peacekeeper more than anything. And he told children to go to bed if it was their curfew. And he lit the, the lampposts to keep it and watched for fires and things like that. The Southern style of policing was slave patrol. And, and, and that primarily, it gave vigilantes uh, the right essentially to do whatever they thought was necessary to try to disrupt insurrection. And more often than not, that was completely unjust. It was breaking up church services for black people. It was, it was uh, violating their, their private space in search for guns or you know, any tools of insurrection. Um, it was asking for papers, stopping them, traffic stops before we had traffic, right? These were foot traffic stops, but show me your papers, show me, that you have the right to be out here. And, um, and so the veins of that, you know, were bequeathed to uh, those, those, those who came after. Um, I forget where I was even going with the history of, with the history of policing in the United States. Sorry, I get off on. Uh, but, but the the low, lowest of man, and then oh, he, right. they described him was a friendless person. He right. was friendless and that's the lowest of man but he still had the right to protect his home. Yeah, and they yeah. tried so hard at his criminal trial to uh, sully his character. Uh, all the men who had testified uh, were basically called back up to say, to, and they were asked the question, what, what do you know of the character of, of, of George Denning? And these guys who had known him their whole lives, who had never had a problem before, or never said as much, to a man, they said, he's, he's a bad man. He's a bad man. He's a bad man over and over and over again. Um, you know, because that was that was the only way they were going to get a conviction. If they could convince people that he was somehow bad, even if they knew that wasn't the case, then uh, the jury would be more likely to send him to prison. I think it's, you know, I, I, I'm glad you were talking about property and the castle doctrine. Um, and you mentioned this before and it's, and it's mentioned in the book, but you know, this this is this case again was kind of an anomaly, right? Because you have um, someone in defense of his property and defense of his family, but he's inside his home, uh, and 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 all the other circumstances that you pointed out, right? Like it's like midnight, and there's like twenty guys outside. It's cold night, not a night to go visiting, and things like that. That all kind of make it questionable, which also then you know sheds light on our our willingness to kind of believe the implausible and suspend kind of rational thought if it if it aligns with whatever prejudice we may hold, right? So like the jury even has to be asked to kind of think, forget about this, like why are they there and, and, and make this assumption. But I wanna go back to the, 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 this idea of property loss just for a second, because you know, you, 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 he loses his property. Um, he loses all of uh, 100 and 114 acres, was that? It? Uh, he loses yeah. over 100 acres of property right. um, that's never been reclaimed, right? And he is one of, you know, I'm sure, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people uh, just in that area for to whom the same thing happened, right? Like like free black folks who 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 thought they had a plot of land that was then taken from them. But I want to draw a couple of other connections before I come back to the question because you mentioned also uh, the former president's kind of uh, speech at Mount Rushmore, uh, 
Uh, and, the, and, and the irony there, right, and even that's on stolen land, that the, the Lakota Sioux have successfully sued the United States for uh, land ownership rights over the Black Hills, but they, they've been offered money, they want the land. And you right. talked about the importance of the land to people and how it means it's not just property, but it's also history. Um, right. And then, you know, and then other instances of, of, of land theft in our country's history that not only haven't been resolved, but that we just don't talk about. So, for example, um, you know, with Japanese internment, you have 110,000 or so people who were kind of taken off their property. Uh, and most of that land was just kind of lost, right? Like they were, you know, arguably in economic competition with folks and were then ordered into internment camps for for four or five years, right? And then and then their land's gone. Like they come home to Washington State and have nothing. But so I, I guess um, I, I wonder if you could like just reflect a little bit on, um, again, because I think one of the wonderful things you do in this book is connect the past to the present. And I don't expect you to be an expert on any of this. So feel free to, to throw the question away. But I wonder, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on you know, kind of the impact of all of the Dennings, if, if you will, and how, and the land loss, and how that might translate to some of the other kind of inequalities we see in our society today. Yeah. Uh, you know, generally speaking along the lines of race and ethnicity, but however else you might want to respond to that. Yeah. Uh, well, in Dennings' case, specifically, we can say that he, you know, this patriarch of, of what was what was becoming a large family uh, lost, uh, you know, things of significant monetary value that he could have bequeathed to his children, and that they might have bequeathed to their own children and so forth. So uh, immediate disconnection from the very first amount of wealth that was gathered by their first emancipated patriarch. Um, you know, we, we, we promised uh, lots of people, lots of things. We, uh, the sort of patriarchal white government probably promised lots of people of color, lots of different things. And, um, and Denning was only promised an opportunity. So what he, what he uh, gathered, that 114 acres and a, and a cabin and you know some livestock and some chickens and some tools and farm implements, all of that has incredible value because it can be passed to the next generation. But when you cut those ties, uh, you know, it's gone. So his family has to try to rebuild from scratch in Jeffersonville. And, um, you know, as I talk about in the book, uh, he won $50,000 in damages, which is equivalent to about $1.2 million today. And that would have gone a very long way in terms of helping put his family on good footing going forward. Uh, he never got that. You know, those farmers claimed to be indigent. They refused to pay. He sued them in court over and over again for the next 20 years and got paid a little bit here and there, but never very much. And so, um, you know, how do you measure that kind of that kind of loss that goes back three or four generations? I, I you know, it's difficult to do, but um, I can say this as well. My um, my friend and colleague who's a uh, an anthropologist around here, she I can't tell you this story because it's 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 not been reported yet. But uh, say she got hired by a major Southern county to account for all lost African-American cemeteries in that county that's on property land. And as she started going through the old records and making note of every cemetery that was ever recorded in both the newspapers and on property records, she's come across somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 black cemeteries that have been paved over, built over, uh, you know, uh, um, are remain uh, uh, lost. Uh, th these are discarded, and there's evidence that all of this happened for you know systemic racist reasons. Um, they'll get over it. We can sell half of this cemetery because this half is contains the contains the the black folks who died. Um, yes, you can bring your road through here. Nobody's going to remember this in two generations. But if you think about that kind of disconnections, 50 cemeteries in a major southern city that have been lost, that are gone. I mean, they're still there. The bones are still in the ground. But, you know, now there's a strip mall built over the top of it or there's a road uh, built over the top of it. So imagine being disconnected. Uh, you know, I know where my ancestors are buried. Bristow, Oklahoma. I can point you to their grave today. 
but imagine being uh, having no connection to your family heritage, at least to the, this is a human right to, to have the ability to mourn and grieve and to have a place to go to do that. It's why we return, it's why we dig up, we, we send people to South American countries where, where there've been great disappearances and they dig up mass graves and they, and they parade grandmothers by the bones to try to identify them, to give the family the opportunity to mourn their dead. It's what makes us different from all other species, the mourning of the dead. And, um, and so think about how many, if that's one American city, think about how many people across the South and across America at large have lost connection to their family history in that very specific and important way. Um, you know, it's a big deal. And it's something that is just now coming to the, into the atmosphere. I mean, we're, 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 we've got our hands full with the police violence, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know, uh, um, but there are a lot of other issues that, that, that need addressing and need that kind of attention. Um, it's a big, a big issue. Yeah, you know, you, and you mentioned, you know, you were just talking about, uh, yeah, it, you know, again, not to give away the book, right, but, you know, uh, uh, Denning's grave site, you know, his, his actual burial site, no one kind of, no one knows where it is. This is where I was going, yeah, I forgot yeah. to mention that, but yeah, we can, we don't know where George, I mean, they know the grave, they know the cemetery, but he's got no headstone, it's, the records are lost to time. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think it's, again, there's another, I think, brilliant aspect of this book is you know you, again you begin talking about these shrines to the Confederacy and you and you and, and toward the end you talk about Bennett Young's support for the Confederacy which you already mentioned kind of the introduction of the book and how all of that is an insistence that we remember these things but then not having for example all of these black cemeteries or not having monuments to enslavement uh, and right. not as tribute but as you know it allows us not to allows us to think of the Confederacy in a different way from how we thought about what it stood for in a lot of ways, right? And so I think oh, yeah. you do a really masterful job just kind of, you know, kind of interjecting these, these curious points of juxtaposition throughout the book. Um, and, 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 you know, I think the, the, the last thing I'll say for now uh, <laughs> is, is um, you know, again, one of the things you say in the very beginning, but I think Young's story really captures this and how you described it. Well, uh, you, you say at the very beginning, um, uh, all public men will be judged. And, and, you know, when you were presenting, you know, Young, who's this, you know, tireless, you know, kind of advocate for Denning and others, right? At the same time, he's also this tireless advocate for remembering the Confederacy. Um, and, 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 and this isn't to, you know, excuse people who I think are, you know, irreparably flawed, but, and I don't think he's one of those people, but it is to say, you know, as we're looking back at history, I don't believe the argument that people are just a man of their times or whatever it is, right? Uh, people make choices, but but people are complicated. And I think the way you present Young's story in this book really kind of gets to the heart of that uh, as well. So so thank you for doing that. Um, I, there is a, a, a question in the chat, if I could ask you a question, um, where uh, the, the person writes, um, uh, well, first, there's a there's a thank you in the chat. This is thank you for this session. I read and enjoyed Grandma's Gatewood Walk, and as a result of this excellent session, I purchased a shot in the moonlight. So, cha ching! There's one one sold okay. for you right there. Uh, but the uh, next uh, the, the 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 next question uh, comes from uh, let's see, Michael or Micah Ramo. Uh, it says this happens in East, East Texas. Many landowners break the tombstones because they're unsightly. It was an uncomfortable fact to accept when I lived in. Hallettsville, Texas, how do you help people recover that kind of history? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough. I think uh, I, I don't claim to be a historian. I'm, I'm certainly a student of history, but I'm, you know, I call myself a journalist. But I think those of us who have the, um, the platform to write about these sorts of things uh, should, do, should do that. You know, these are stories that are waiting to be told. Um, since this book has come out, somebody has uh, begun the effort of trying to get an historical marker in Jeffersonville, Indiana, in honor of George Denning, that would have a, you know, a paragraph of information explaining his significance in uh, American history, which I think is a very cool thing. And it's how we, it's come way too late, but it's how we begin to acknowledge uh, these things and maybe to help people who are descendant from him um, 
I don't know if heal is the right word, but to, you know, uh, uh, begin to repair perhaps from, from that trauma. I have no doubt that, you know, that trauma is passed down, that the fear of, of, you know, the fear of that night, January 27, 1897, still exists in the descendants of George Denning. It must, it is part of, uh, you know, it's part of what makes them, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, so we gotta, we, we gotta step up and tell these stories uh, in a big way, I think. And like I said, there, there, there's, it, it comes in this period of, of time of American history when the, the history is white. It's written by, you know, by and large by white people, but there are still voices out there that can be identified that were either white and sympathetic with the, with the cause of freedom and justice, or, uh, or they, they were written by, um, by, by black people including Ida B. Wells, and she is one of many, and it turns out there were many, many black newspapers at that time and doing great work, very brave, independent black journalists who are doing, uh, doing that great work. Um, but even some of their newspapers are difficult to access right now, uh, where like lots of more mainstream newspapers have been uploaded and are now digitally searchable. Um, so, uh, you know, got to ferret it out and find those stories and tell them and, um, uh, you know, and, and do things like, 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 um, like the New York Times and Hannah Nicole Jones has, uh, they, they, what, like they've started doing with the 1619 Project. And it's so interesting to see uh, the debate about that. I think it, it sharpens all of us to hear that debate. But, um, but if you never try to do something like that, like a, an interesting and super important reframing of American history from a more multicultural aspect, then we're gonna be stuck with this garbage history that I grew up with, you know? We celebrated the land run, I'll age myself, born in 78, but we celebrated the, land, celebrated the Oklahoma land run in 1989, I think, on the centennial. And we, all the kids, so I was what? nine or 10, all the kids, I remember we dressed up like pioneers and they took us across the street to the, to the football field and they gave us stakes and they uh, told us to run across the field and hammer our little stakes into a square. And that was the, that was our land. And that's where we could have our picnic lunch. It was a recreation of the Oklahoma land run. And nobody ever mentioned that this land had previously been promised to uh, people from different tribes who had been marched at gunpoint uh, at the cost of thousands of lives uh, from places in the Southeast to, uh, to Oklahoma. And we're told, all right, this is yours. This is yours now forever, except not forever because we're about to take it back. You know, that was never a part of that history lesson. And uh, so it's up to us now to try to correct a lot of this stuff. It's not just the black experience, uh, it's an incredibly important part of it, but it is the experience of a lot of different Americans who, um, uh, you know, who uh, have been ignored by white people uh, for several hundred thousands of years, whatever it is. Yeah, you mentioned in the book that um, how each of the witnesses were called back to the stand to um, put down uh, George Denning. Uh, so I'm gonna let Mary uh, bring it to today uh, on what's going on with the um, George Floyd case, Mary. We talk about that ahead of time. I, I wasn't aware that I that I was going to be talking about. I do I, I I do have some comments though that that have directly to do with George Floyd. When you said Sully his character, uh, we, we're seeing that today. Yeah. And there's a there's an emerging field in psychology called epigenetics, in which. Uh, they argue that that there's a kind of PTSD that is passed down from generation to generation to generation. And I think we're, we're experiencing that. I have spoken with so many African-Americans on Twitter and Facebook and in person who have said, I cannot watch this trial. Mm. I cannot watch it because it is just too painful. And, I, and, and so it, it makes perfect sense that you, you, you suggest that his family is still feeling this. Yeah. Uh, and one of, the, one of the hardest things to convey to students is this idea of wealth and inheritance. Um, we, you put a face on 
a property that was not inherited, that failed to be inherited. But we don't know the faces of Rosewood or Tulsa yeah. or it, uh, recently in, in, uh, in California, in Southern California, it's Bruce's Beach. Beach yeah. Uh, yeah. And this, this beach is, is, has been valued at about $75 million. And this was taken away from this family, law-abiding family, early in the, the, the 20th century. And, uh, you know, I was recently speaking with, um, with uh, some filmmakers in, in Boston, and they gave me a figure that was just unbelievable. The white wealth in Boston is $200,000, over $200,000 and black wealth is $7. Wow. That, I, I, I could not believe it, but these folks are, they're filmmakers, they have been living in Boston all their lives and, and had to include that in their film. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think when it comes to black wealth, white wealth, uh, Latino wealth, you know, it's inheritance. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, do we, what do we get from our, our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents. So I thank you for putting a face uh, on on someone whose land was stolen because uh, we don't see the faces, we don't know the faces, we don't um, we don't know about Ida B. Wells, uh, her newspaper business being burned out, and she had to flee Memphis to uh, to go to Chicago uh, because she was afraid they would do to her like what they did to to uh, her friends. So uh, I, I guess I don't have as much a question as just a thank you. Thank you very much. This is very special. And I want people to know who are in our audience that we have been getting these wonderful people to come in and talk over the last uh, almost year now since the death of George Floyd and have not paid anyone. I don't know if you wanted to make that public, Ben, or what, but, but these, these folks have been coming in and have just been so generous and so gracious with their time. And, uh, and so I doubly want to thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you so much. Very kind of or, or did you not know you weren't we, getting paid? We it, was that, uh, is we that... it. <laughs> it's not about the money. <laughs> Uh, it, it, thank you for, for that, uh, Dr. Texera, and um, I, I, do, I do appreciate that you brought up, you know, you brought up Tulsa, you brought up Rosewood, and the other connecting point is the other thing we often don't talk about. I mean, these are individual stories. Um, we, we pay more attention maybe to, to the policy. So you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the, the, the land rush in Oklahoma. Um, you know, we also had the Homestead Acts. We also had the uh, exclusion of Black veterans from the GI Bill's benefits yeah. and things like that that led directly to home ownership in the 1940s and 1950s and so on. So, you know, I think this is just another, these are just another other critical pieces of that bigger story that talk about, you know, you know people don't like the term necessarily, but the, the systemic ways that we have perpetuated inequality, right? Um, yeah. I know we, we promised to wrap by 4.30. So I, I, I do selfishly have one kind of concluding question, if you'll indulge me. Uh, uh, and and it, it, uh, it could be a statement or it could be a question. I'm gonna make it a question and make it brief. But you, know, you, you say a couple of things. One, I love this line. You say a path to reparations had been made available him, uh, to him. You're talking about George, George Dinning. Uh, a good lawyer had agreed to help and here he stood on the brink of justice. So, so I, I love that statement. Um, you also then talk about Judge Evans uh, during, the, uh, during the criminal trial and you say, or, um, uh, or this is the civil uh, uh, trial, I think. Anyway, you say Judge Evans instructions and the verdict of the jury ought to be a warning who would be assassins and midnight raiders that Uncle Sam will find a way to punish them when state law fails. And that's a quote from one of the uh, local newspapers at that time, but Uncle Sam will find a way to punish them when state law fails. And embedded in that is this understanding that oftentimes state and local officials were complicit in, or at least turned a blind eye to these instances of, of, of racial inequality, inequality and racial injustice. Um, but I, my question to you is this, you know, as, as we're sitting here, you know, looking at, for example, um, the post, post-election push for voter security uh, or election security and so on, which many people, uh, myself included, have, have argued that uh, you know, it discriminates against people of color and, and, and poor people and things like that. People are saying the, the federal government ought, 
play a role in this. And I think from the story that you tell, you know, the federal government actually played, and, and the state government too, but the federal government had to play a role in ensuring that the rights of, in this case, Black folks in Kentucky, but just in general, weren't completely just trampled. Yeah. So my question is, I guess, you know, in, in bringing it to the present, um, is there a role for the federal government in, in kind of continuing to resolve what you've described and what we've all talked about as kind of ongoing issues of, of racial injustice in this country? Yeah, of course. And I mean, so often it, it's it's the federal government at fault for some of the big policies that uh, that, you know, most dramatically affect um, black folks. And I'm thinking of, you know, just the war on drugs. Uh, that was that that was top down, um, uh, you know, and so, so many, so many other things. Uh, discriminatory housing policy, um, you know. Our first black president, Bill Clinton, uh, yes. passed, some, <laughs> passed some legislation, uh, uh, housing legislation, and you know HUD legislation that has cost the black community greatly. Uh, has separated people from from their land because their land became public housing complexes, and they grew gardens, and they knew their neighbors, and then Clinton relocated them to the suburbs, and. They lost their connection to that that property. So uh, sometimes, you know, urban development uh, in the '70s. There's so many federal projects that have um, that have hurt the black community. I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you deal with the I don't know how you deal with the voting rights issue. Uh, the, I think it's going to be really interesting to see if Georgia. Um, listens to the economic interests that are threat making threats right now. Florida is considering the same sort of legislation, voting restriction that, that would make it harder for, you know, people to, to, to vote. Uh, and they've already received threats from the NCAA. We're not going to do any events in the state of Florida if you all uh, uh, put, put these bills in place. So I think people, you know, in the same way that the economics have prompted the governor of Kentucky and the state legislature in Kentucky to move to try to reduce the violence and the number of lynchings that were playing out in that state in order to entice business and industry and uh, tourism and so forth. Um, uh, you know, in, in that same way, it'll, I think this will have an effect. So maybe the, maybe the uh, federal inter intervention isn't um, totally called for quite yet, but um, you know, isn't it interesting that we're still playing, playing, uh, working those things out all these years later, uh, we're still figuring out where states rights ends and where, um, you know, federal government has the right to step in. But you got some crazy politicians in your state. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on. <laughs> we do. Much. Uh, it makes it, it, makes it a great state to be. Understanding to reasoning and, and, and logic. <laughs> right. What are your hopes for thank, Florida? <laughs> thank you so much, Ben, for joining us today. Uh, so much history. I, that that book was uh, amazing. Those that are still participants that are still with us, if you can get your hands on the book, read it. It's a very uh, educational book and um, a good show. And thank you, uh, Dean uh, uh, Muhammad, for joining us today and uh, stepping in. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Futch, and nice to be with you all. I really appreciate it. Nice Thank to meet you, Ben. The, the book care. is fantastic, as Stan said. Anybody that hasn't read it should go read it. It's a wonderful read, uh, and I don't offer that praise lightly. So thank you very much. Now that you spoiled the end of it for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, still, there's still some cliffhangers in there for you. <laughs> there it is. Um, so, so, yeah, Thanks, I, I know that Jeremy wants to sign off for the group. Uh, otherwise, I'll happily... This, or Stan, you just brought it to a close. Stan, why don't you take us away again since I stepped so, up? Like I said, thanks hey, again. Uh, so much, so much information. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I still will enjoy the ending. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. So much, everybody. Take care. Take right. care.